Hello, welcome to chapter three, the cardiorespiratory system. Um, this is a remake from the original. Um, there was a couple of issues with the chapter three one that we wanted to fix. So this is just a remake. Nothing is going to be greatly different from the first one to the second one. So for those of you that are watching this for the first time, you know, you're getting just a, a slightly different, you know, video, but it's going to have the same information anyway. So let's, let's rock and roll with this. Let's get through um, the CR system so that we can kind of understand what happens with the heart, the lungs, all the blood vessels, and the blood that is actually made up of it. So let's kind of rock through this here. So the cardiorespiratory system basically is like, you know, it, it, its job is to maintain efficiency. So we want to constantly have um, blood moving so we can have oxygen moving throughout the body so that we can get rid of waste byproduct like carbon, di uh, carbon dioxide. So there's a lot of efficiency that needs to happen. Any compromising of that and you're basically going to affect both the respiratory and the cardiovascular system together. So there needs to be a well-oiled machine here. All right. So if you have atherosclerosis, for example, or a narrowing or a constricting of the blood vessels via um, lipid accumulation, then ultimately what's going to happen is you're, you're going to restrict blood flow. So when you restrict blood flow, you restrict the amount of oxygen that can get to where it needs to go, therefore diminishing performance or even just in general diminishing um, being able to go up and down stairs, for example, and you'll get really fatigued because of that. So having everything work together is really, really important because of the fact that HMS, remember, is the human movement system. If these two systems do not work correctly together, then ultimately you're going to affect, you know, oxygen, nutrients, like it says, oxygen, nutrients, protective agents, but we can also lump into their hormones, we can lump into their enzymes, we can lump into their, um, basically, any assisting cellular enhancers that can get to where they have to go okay and at that point there once you get working then the need to remove waste products is going to be important so carbon dioxide lactate are just a few um, then you're, you're gonna you can break that down even smaller and we can talk about removing um, specific things like what you know um, uric acid which can lead to if you if you've ever heard of people who have gout having that removed if it doesn't allow for accumulation then you won't have those responses all right so what do we got we got the cardiovascular system so the cardiovascular system itself the heart the blood that circulates through the blood vessels all right and all of that is necessary so that we can have proper moving blood because eventually what's going to need to have have to happen is proper moving blood is going to carry proper levels of oxygen depending upon you as the person. All right. So again, on the test, you need to make sure that when you're looking at something, if it asks anything about the cardio -va 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 vascular system, not the cardiorespiratory system, the cardiovascular system, you're talking specifically about the heart only, the blood only, and the blood vessels. Okay. Cardiorespiratory would include the lungs in terms of that. All right, so let's break down the first major component. All right, now you got the heart. All right, what is the job's heart? Rhythmically contract to become a necessary pump to basically push blood through the body. It's amazing that when you have that much pressure, like your blood pressure, all right, how much that pressure can actually force, or if you think about it, how small in relationship to the rest of our body, how small these blood vessels are in diameter and how much pressure it would take for the blood to be able to travel from the heart all the way down to the extremities like the feet. Okay, so there ha it's, a, it's a very good push. Even at resting levels, it's just, you know, because what's going to happen is the healthier you are, the less constriction you have of blood being able to be moved. Now, constriction meaning not like it's narrowing, but constriction meaning there's going to be pressure pushing back against the pressure that you have via something like for example, constricting of blood vessels in general. So I don't want you to get those two terms totally confused, even though they're very similar, but that's what we're working with there. All right, so a heart, again, a muscular pump that rhythmically contracts to push blood throughout the, blood, the, throughout the body. All right, the heart muscle itself, um, the myocardium, is uh, a very, very strong, very powerful muscle. Um, a set of muscles because you got to figure it, it, all of, so let's blow this up a little bit here. 
All right, all of these blood vessel, uh, blood vessels, these chambers around the heart, it's all it's all cardiac muscle, which is very similar to skeletal muscle, but just a slight different pattern of how they overlay each other when they contract. But again, very powerful. They they're working twenty four seven. Okay, you want, while you're sleeping, your heart's still pumping. You know, while you're moving, your heart's still pumping. All right, so we have to be able to understand that those are the reasons why the heart is so important to keep healthy because if we can get it to work a little bit less and still be just as effective and efficient, the better off it is for us. All right, so let's let's take up a little bit. I'm going to blow this picture up a little bit. We already know what it says in that there. But when you look at your, your heart itself, okay, right atrium, right ventricle, left atrium, left ventricle, okay, and all of these have a specific pattern that they're supposed to be able to conduct, all right? So um, if you ever heard about the lub dub or, you know, top, top bottom, basically what we're talking about there is that's the contraction. So if you're, you know, if you're listening to the heartbeat, it's not just bump, bump, it's bump, 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 you know, it's got two beats to it. And how does that work? You got one node here, your SA node, you have one node here, your AV node. All right, whoops, we don't wanna, we don't wanna format that. So with your SA node located right here, right above the right atrium, all right, and then your atrioventricular node, which is right in between where it lies with your, um, right in between your right atrium and right ventricle, what's gonna happen is the, the lub and the dub, which are two distinct sounds, are gonna come from the SA node first, located up here. So in the name, sinoatrial, what that means is that the atrium are going to contract first. So when you hear the lub, what's happening is the top of the heart is releasing blood down into the ventricle. So the right atrium, left atrium are letting blood into the ventricles. When you hear the AV node fire off, the secondary pulse, okay, or the second dub, all right, what's gonna happen there is through all of these um, bundles and then the fiber branches around them, that's going to create a contraction of the ventricles and that what's going to happen is from the right ventricle, the blood's going to be released out to the lungs and then from the left ventricle, blood is going to be released out through the aorta to the um, rest of the body. Now the right ventricle, what's going to happen is you're going to have a release of blood out into the pulmonary artery okay and then i'll take that blood to the lungs so it, it can become aerated meaning it can gather oxygen and then it can start flowing back to the heart back via the from from the pulmonary vein to the left atrium okay so that's some of the track that we're going to talk about there so you know in terms of the contraction okay um we talked a little bit more about how the fibers are very similar to skeletal muscle um, they're shorter and more tightly connected. So that means they have a little bit more for, they can get a little bit of quality force in them. Um, so the cool thing though, is because of the, the formation, like it says here, it enables the contraction of one fiber to stimulate the others to contract synchronously. So what we're saying there is that when one goes off, they all know to go. So there isn't a lack in that, unless of course you start to have deteriorations within the heart itself. So you know, and that's something that we want to try to avoid at all costs. Um, like it says there, the cardiac muscle fibers have a built-in contraction rhythm. And then, um, you know, how do we know what that rhythm is? Well, again, the rhythm of the heartbeat itself is your EKG. But, you know, in terms of fiber contraction, we're talking about your heart rate, your, you know, your pulse. So, you know, now typically it's about 70 to 80 beats per minute we can obviously be lower than that. And if we are healthy, we want to see that it's lower than that because that means that the heart doesn't have to beat as often, but can pump out just as much blood as any other time. Um, elite marathon runners, if you look, if you look up some of their levels and they're, they're very, very effective and very efficient in what they do, you know, you're looking at them in, in, in the high twenties, low thirties for their heart rate. So if you take the average of that and say it's 30, I mean, you got to figure your heart's beating every two seconds per minute. And you kind of just sit there and go, oh, wow, this is kind of crazy. When is my heart going to beat again? And it's like, oh, there it goes. You know, and then, you know, so it just means that you can be low like that in your heart rate 
as long as you are deemed healthy, all right, if your heart is heart rate is low because of medications and stuff like that, that's simply because that there's an offset of your 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 system because of the fact that you're taking medication. So that doesn't necessarily mean it's healthy. But again, you know, an elite marathon runner, well, I mean, I think that they're pretty, you know, we can deem them pretty healthy, especially um, cardiorespiratorily. All right. We talked about the SA node, you know, and, and the one thing about, and I left this out because I wanted to kind of wait until we got to that point. But if you ever are wondering, hmm, a little lack on there. So if you're ever wondering what, um, which one of those nodes is considered your pacemaker, well, there it is. Okay, your SA node is the pacemaker. So anybody that you know of that has a installed pacemaker or any of your clients that have pacemakers, that's going to be because their SA node can no longer fire appropriately and then, you know, you end up with bad atrial, you know, contraction. All right, there's your AV node, slight impulse delay. All right, and then there's the passing of impulses through your bundles to your fibers, which is exactly what we just talked about. So this fiber, if we were kind of uh, this fiber, this slide, whoops, wrong way. This slide here would be slide six, and it's going to directly correlate to slide four with what we just talked about. So if you question anything from slide six, just go back to slide four and listen to what we had to say about that one, okay? Because everything was written out for us there. But again, just talking about positive rhythms and if any of those rhythms become disrupted then that means that there's usually an issue with the nodes that are firing so you know that's something where we're not going to even touch that that's something that's going to basically have to be diagnosed by a physician md all right so that they can be able to tell you what's wrong and how you can affect you know, effectively help them all right so the structure we kind of hit on this a little bit here but kind of opening this up a little bit more all right if we look, there again is your right atrium, here's your right ventricle, all right, and then your left atrium and your left ventricle. And this basically is showing you how everything flows accordingly to where it needs to come into. So um, blue, if you see any blue there, what we're saying there is that at any point, this is where deoxygenated blood would be. So there's no oxygen. I shouldn't say, don't say that word because that's really a strong, a no is unstrong. But what we're saying there is there is minimal oxygen that is in there at that point. And that's basically, if you want to put a good word, it's kind of like waste, waste blood. It's the blood that's coming back to the heart from the working muscle. So it's a little bit of waste byproduct there. Um, so there's more CO2 in those and less, lesser of O2. And so there we see our left pulmonary artery. There's your right pulmonary artery, and those are sending deoxygenated blood back to the lungs. Okay, here's your pulmonary veins that are coming, and they're they're coming back to your uh, your left ventricle, your left atrium. That's going to send it down to the left ventricle here, and then the, that's going to get sent out through the aorta. Okay, and just follow your lines. Okay, follow the lines. Blood coming in right uh, right ventricle sending blood out here through the pulmonary arteries and then blood will come back in over here back in from the pulmonary veins down into the left ventricle out through the aorta around and down or up depending upon which way this is the aortic arch and this is where you're going to have blood being transferred to other areas but again there's your descending aorta so it comes behind the heart and bam, descending, that's gonna go down to the rest of the, of the lower extremities, okay? So this is just ways that we can see that. Um, the other thing that's very interesting to note here is this wall right here. This wall right here is called the septum and that's what separates the left and the right sides um, so that you can basically have a divide so that you know that there is the left and right chambers, okay? So again, what's the function of the heart? It's to be able to push blood to the rest of the body, okay? Um, so each contraction of a ventricle pushes blood from the heart into the body. Now, you gotta be very specific with that because the left ventricle pushes blood to the rest of the body. The right ventricle push, pushes blood to the lungs, which then can become oxygenated, okay? Or can get oxygen put into the blood so that it can get sent to the rest of the body. So a couple of different terms that we wanna make sure of. SV, okay, 
That means stroke volume. Stroke volume basically means it's for every um, every beat of the heart, the blood that's released out to the rest of the body is your stroke volume. So per beat amount of blood is stroke volume. And then heart rate is the, the pulsation of your heart each time the heart pumps. So whenever the heart, the heart rate pumps, it releases stroke volume. And then how do you know what cardiac output is right here? That is basically saying it's your stroke volume times your heart rate. So let's just say here, so stroke volume times heart rate equals Q or cardiac output, okay? Now the cool thing about that is, you know, Q is another label for it, but we'll just call it cardiac output for our sake. Now, so just say that, you know, someone has a 500 milliliter uh, stroke volume and their heart rate is just say 80. What 80 beats per minute? What this means is that you're gonna have 40,000 milliliters, can't type right now, um, per minute. All right, so that that's pretty high. Um, this is just a just to kind of show you how you can determine that. Um, and then this equals to be uh, 40 liters because for every thousand milliliters is a liter. All right, so that's a lot. Now, typically, when we are, you know, at rest, it's going to be much lower than that. So um, that's also going to be very important to understand, and so that we can. Um, you know, basically understand how much blood is being pumped throughout the whole body um, during during rest or during um, during exercise. All right. So, you know, again, this is a, a fairly high number, and and it can be higher based on you know how hard you're actually working. So, if we were to actually take this number and go to 120 beats per minute, then we can see what we're really at you know, in terms of, of milliliters of or liters of blood per minute, okay? So again, just kind of throwing some random numbers out there to you so you can kind of just get the gist of that, all right? Um, let's see. Monitoring. Well, again, you know, there's multiple ways that you can monitor. Be careful with heart rate monitoring because that's not the, that's a algorithm based so that may not be the best situation but again it's it, it gives you information that gets feedback pretty quickly all right so if you look down here they're saying if you do a six second and then you get 17 beats in six seconds you add the zero to it because it's, it's basically multiply it by 10 okay if you do a 15 second count to monitor your heart rate so you're going to take either from your um, radial or your carotid um, arteries, so either on the thumb side of your wrist or right on the side of your neck, okay? Then ultimately, you can do it for, you know, 15 seconds times four, you can do 30 seconds times two, but what's your most accurate? Do a complete 60 second if you can, okay? Um, this will definitely help you because it, it is a full minute, but you know what? It, it's better to get, if you really want a one minute pulse read, just do it for a minute. But if you're crunched on time, I totally understand. So there are quick ways to do it. And then the six second count, that's pretty quick. It's a little bit less accurate, obviously. But, you know, if you are if you have six seconds, it, it happens, you can get it done really quick. You just take the six second count and just add a zero to the end of it because you're going six times 10 in 60 seconds. All right. So why do we want to monitor heart rate? Well, because we want to know where our clients are at at all times. We want to know where our patients and our athletes are at at all times. That's why heart rate monitoring straps um, are really good because it gives you instantaneous feedback for what you have to do. Okay. Um, in terms of blood, um, it says here the average human body holds about five liters of blood at any given time. That is constantly changing because um, at certain times you can, you know, if, if under dehydrative times when you're dehydrated, um, you can lose a little bit of blood volume. Um, but at other times it's going to be, you know, it's pretty standard. That's going to hold about five liters. Now that again, can always ebb and flow. The thickness can change in it. All right. There can be changes in, you know, temperature that are going to help with sweating. 
All right, so the temp the body temperature will affect blood and where it goes. All right, so all these things are really important because at any given time, what's the whole purpose? It's to deliver and remove and then collect at that time too. So it's, you know, we're, we're constantly using blood for many different reasons. All right, so the, the healthier we are, the more blood can get to where it needs to go because then, like it says down here, you can end up with, you know, the transporting of everything that we talked about previously, oxygen, hormones, nutrients to where they got to go. And then there's also the fact that we want to clear out any waste products. Okay. This can help with body temperature regulation, pH level um, regulation. So, the, the, you know, we want to basically be almost at about a seven. That's our homeostasis value. Anything above that, anything above a seven is basic. Anything below that is acidic. So if our body is changing, blood can help with removal as our, as our system detects that. It can help um, protect us from injury. Um, we can have clotting mechanisms that are used to help us basically seal off those, those uh, cuts that we have, the penetrations that you may have, depending upon what it was that was there. So blood can deliver platelets as needed to help a clotting mechanism. And then provide uh, immune cells to fight, all right? So, you know, without our immune system engaged, we can't send out killer T cells or, uh, or we can't have our white blood cells as we need them to be able to go out and fight and attack, you know, because we'd always be sick at that time, at that point in time, actually. All right? So, um, you know, how does blood get to where it has to go? Well, blood gets to where it goes because it has vessels, Okay. So the two major sized vessels that we will talk about, and they're pretty much shown in this image right here, are your arteries. And those are going to be your, you know, the bigger red, okay? And then you're going to have your veins, which the other major. So the red is more for oxygenated blood. The blue is more for deoxygenated blood, all right? And those are the veins, which, you know, arteries take blood and push it away from the heart and then veins take blood back to the heart. And so what is the, um, the, the, the smaller, more intricate? Nope, they don't even go into it. Okay, that would be your capillaries. Okay, and your capillaries job is diffusion um, and transport, uh, transfer. Okay, so what happens here is Spelled it. Oh, I can't type today. So there's your capillaries. All right. One of the issues that has to have, you know, one of the major problems that we have is that capillaries can sometimes not be present when they, you know, we need the healthier you get, the more capillaries we can actually grow and facilitate. So the healthier you are, the more capillary beds you have that surround muscles, surround the heart, sur uh, excuse me, surround the lungs, right? So we can have diffusion or, or transfer of oxygen into the muscles from the alveoli into the lungs or into the into the cat oh my word i'm having a hard time talking today so the blood vessels of the capillaries in around that surround the alveoli are taking basically oxygen from the lungs or the alveoli within the lungs and they transfer to the capillaries to send it back to the heart so just need to slow down a little bit there. So that's what's really important there is that capillaries will do that. They'll allow for transfer of oxygen in. And then what happens is it can allow for transfer into working muscles. And then it can have the ability to pull out carbon dioxide to send out as a waste byproduct because our system does not like a lot of carbon, uh, carbon dioxide in our system or CO2. Um, so it wants to get rid of it at all costs. All right, or as quickly as possible because the higher it gets, that's going to fatigue our system out greater. Okay, so again, you have your arteries which transport blood away from the heart, veins send it back to the heart, capillaries are going to be the diffuser, and they're going to be basically surrounding major organs, muscle, lungs, which are all you know very important for our existence and our movement. All right, so here's your respiratory system. We talked about the lungs a little bit already. Um, but again, its primary role is to ensure proper cellular functioning, okay? Um, it's very important for that. So what does it need to do? It needs to be able to collect oxygen and then distribute it through the bloodstream to the rest of the body, okay? And that's going to be very important for us during exercise, but also it's very important for us for just for sustained normal living, okay? 
So there's your lungs. All right. We know that the airway itself got the, you can, you know, obviously get, so let's, let's blow it up a little bit so we can kind of get a better indicator here. So we'll pull that open. So, you know, how do, are, are you a nose breather or are you a mouth breather? So <laughs> and it's just kind of funny every time you hear that, you always go back to the stranger things. But really it does, you know, it matters, right? You know, do you have a tendency to breathe through your nose or do you breathe through your mouth? Or do you breathe out through your nose or in, you know, whatever way it may be? So what we're talking about here is the nose and the mouth are your first line, okay? Air is going to pass through your pharynx and then it's going to pass by your larynx and then it's going to end up going down your trachea, okay? Once it reaches, so there you go, nose or, you know, navel cav nasal cavity, there's your mouth, so it'll go in, down the pharynx, passing the larynx or your voice box, down the trachea, okay? And then it's going to break off into these branches, big tree trunk, these big trunks here. That would be your bronchi, the branches off of that over in here, and then you can see the, the blown up version, that's your bronchioles, or the, the, the tree limbs. And then right down here, again, kind of a little bit harder to see, but we'll see if we can blow it up just a little bit more. There's your alveoli, and that was what I was talking about before. Those are those air sacs that contain oxygen that come in um, to the lungs. Now, there's your, this is your capillary that's gonna get oxygen that already has it and is sending it out. This in the, alveo the alveoli is deoxygenated. That's going to be where, you know, deoxygenated blood comes in. It's going to get oxygenated and then it's going to go out. So at the same point here, this transfer point is where carbon dioxide is in and it's going to get sent out and go reverse up the bronchioles, through the bronchi, up the trachea, past the larynx, past the pharynx, and out into the external environment. So that's the transfer point that happens at this area right here. So it's very important to understand that those are the things that happen within the lungs and that it's constantly happening all the time. Can you control, you know, breathing is a involuntary action, but you can make it voluntary. Okay. You can try to slow your breathing down or speed it up as you need to. Okay. So, it, but the breathing, the internal breathing or respiration that happens inside of your alveoli is very important because you're now having this transfer of O2 in, CO2 out, right in those little air-filled sacs. And these are going to be the major issues that, you know, smokers, environmental factors, they can affect these alveoli, <coughs> excuse me, and they can deaden this area here. And any of these alveoli that become deadened cannot become rejuvenated. They, they are dead. All right, and so that means that the more of these you kill, the worse off it's going to be for you to be able to take oxygen in and remove CO2. So very, very important, again, that we keep our lungs as healthy as possible. So with your pumping, okay, with your pumping, you have two phases. You have an inspiratory and expiratory. Um, so your inspiratory ins um, factors are your inhalation and your expiratory which is your exhalation, those breathing in, breathing out, okay? With, you know, with help with that breathing in, your sternum, your ribs, and your vertebrae all can help, okay? So with those bones that help, you know, the ribs and the sternum will rise and then they'll collapse. Now, don't, collapse is a kind of a harsh word again, but they'll return back to, so to allow, you know, the air that was in your lungs to get sent out. So the muscles for inspiration, the diaphragm, the external intercostals, which are the basically the muscles that will run in between your rib cage. There's two sets of them. The external will help with bringing air in. Your scalenes within your neck, the sternocleidomastoid within your neck, and then your pectoralis minor, your chest, smaller chest muscle. Those will all be helping for inspiration. And then on the way out, in uh, the internal intercostals, the other, the other muscles that run in uh, the opposite direction to your external, in between your ribs and then your abdominals can help with blowing air out or exp uh, expiration. Um, so with the passageways, you know, again, air must have passageways. And so you have uh, the conduction passageway and the respiratory passageway. All right. And those are your two ways that you're going to allow, you know, air in, air out. 
Okay, but what's going to be the major factor in that is going to be the diaphragm and how it's going to be able to allow you to, um, it's because you know, the major muscle, it's going to allow air in or air out depending upon what you're in the process of doing. But like we said, we talked about the conduction passion away already, the nasal cavity or the oral cavity of the mouth, the pharynx, the larynx, the trachea, and then we said the bronchi. Now the respiratory passageway is the alveoli and the alveolar sacs. Okay, so we kind of hit on this already, and if we, again, going back to, if you want to revi review that, then go back to chapter, uh, chapter, wow, slide 13, and, and go back and listen to the part about this big uh, picture that we just talked about, and that'll kind of sum up what happened with uh, this slide here for respiratory and conduction passageways. Um, so with functioning, we've already talked about this before, but the cardiovascular and respiratory systems make up the cardiorespiratory system itself. We already talked about, you know, respiratory system providing oxygen and then the cardiovascular system transporting that oxygen to wherever it needs to go. At rest, it, all the body will function off of that because at rest, we are aerobic, meaning that our body works aerobically, meaning it needs oxygen to be able to use ATP or energy to be able to function. Okay, so at rest, you know, that's what we need. But during, you know, training, specific training, then we know that if it's anaerobic, that means it doesn't require oxygen, but other areas might. Okay, so we just have to be very cautious with the energy systems that we're talking about there. But again, respiratory system is all about aeration or oxygen in, and the cardiovascular system is all about that oxygen in and sending it out to the rest of the body. All right, so typically at rest, you're talking about the oxygen consumption or VO2, all right? So if you ever, you know, see v, you know, this VO2, a lot of times you might see VO2 max, but VO2 means oxygen consumption, okay? VO2 max means maximal oxygen consumption. So what is it at rest? It's about 3.5 milliliters per kilogram of body weight you are per minute. Okay, so if you weigh 100 kilograms, then you're going to take in 350 milliliters of air per minute. Okay, and that's just because you're taking in weight into it's relative taking weight into account. Okay, um, maximum oxygen consumption is what you're going to, you know, what you're basically assessing people on. And it's a way that you can, as it says here, gauge cardiorespiratory fitness. All right, so if you were to get a VO2 max test done then we can determine your level of fitness, really your level of conditioning at that point and make proper um, estimations as to where you should be working in terms of intensity or load, okay? Um, so that's just really important. And so that's where, you know, when we talk about the fitness assessment chapter, this is gonna become very crucial because then we can understand where, you know, how much oxygen you're really consuming in that minute, you know, of all out intensity. And does that mean you can sustain it? Okay. So a lot of times too, there's dysfunctional breathing that can occur. Do you have asthma? Do you have a COPD? Um, is there narrowing of, you know, blood vessels that's causing you to um, have to breathe in more oxygen because it's being so constricted? There's a lot of different things that can happen. So understanding that again, if the, the cardiovascular and the respiratory system are not working together cooperatively, then ultimately you're not gonna have that efficient functioning of both systems and you're gonna have that dysfunction at some point. All right. Um, so what ends up, you know, so if we go a little bit deeper, if we talk about breathing patterns or alter, altering those, you know, like it says here, during shallow breathing patterns, secondary respiratory muscles are used more predominantly. So instead of using the diaphragm, you're actually using other components of that, you know, and so because of that, you end up with a greater use of specific muscles like the scalenes, the sternocleidomastoid, the levator group, and then the upper traps. So it's really, really important to understand that, you know, if we can control our breathing correctly, then we are not going to have these uh, muscles be engaged when they really don't need to be. Therefore, that could even change posture, okay? It can start causing lower back pain. It can cause 
issues from you know the ankles to the back of the head all right so we have to be aware of that and then the other thing too in in certain cases it can result in like it says headaches lightheadedness or dizziness or even fainting and passing out so dysfunctional breathing is really really a um a really important thing to pay attention to and that by doing proper breathing mechanisms you end up with the correct um, the correct breathing pattern and therefore you end up with a lack of use of these muscles. I'll highlight them one more time. And when you lack the use of those muscles, they're not becoming overworked and then they don't become dysfunctional, meaning they don't, they're not firing when they're supposed, you know, they're not, they're not becoming fired when they're supposed to stay rested. So that can really become a component of that. So again, this is the cardiorespiratory system. Okay. Um, it's one of those chapters that there's a lot of valuable information, even though it's fairly short, but don't disregard this. You know, the heart, the lungs, the blood vessels, the blood, all of that becomes really important in understanding what it is that you need to know about this system. And then uh, again, if you're going to sit for the CPT test, then ultimately, what are we saying? That it's going to be um, vital that you pay attention to these because this is a vital system that we have to pay attention to at all costs. All right. Again, if you have any questions, please feel to reach out. Um, but I definitely think that, again, paying more attention to this chapter is going to be vital for you so that when you go to study, it'll be re you know, ready for you. And then for those of you in the general public, again, leave a comment if you have any questions. Um, you know, Feel free to reach out. And then if you need any other information, I can try to help you as much as possible. So. Thanks, everybody, for listening. Um, pay attention to this chapter. Again, it's one of the four that we're doing for the week for my class. So um, have a little fun with it. Take care. Talk to you guys soon.